Hi, Joe. How are you? I've missed you. Missed seeing you. Courtney. Hi, how are you? Uh, hello, everybody, on this first day of uh, June. Um, that's what it is. It's Monday, and it's the first day of June. Jeannie, 506, Rita, Four Homes, thank you. Missed you guys, too. Uh, so happy to be back home together. Um, uh, we took a couple days off to get into summer to try to figure out our summer hours, but uh, we felt that it was really important today to be together. And uh, that's why we took the home together off because so many people aren't home together anymore. They're not at stay at home orders, but perhaps now more than ever, we need to figure out what it means to be together. We need to understand what that word conveys and how we can all move forward together. Um, in my life and in the last many years, I've written a lot uh, in the Sunday paper about coming together about paving a new way forward, about building a more caring, compassionate, and collaborative world. I write about that kind of every Sunday in the Sunday paper, and uh, it's never been more important than it is right now. We're in a historic moment in our country. These are um, really distressing, difficult times for everybody. People are scared, they're anxious, um, our African-American brothers and sisters feel unseen, unheard, invisible. They feel they've been asking for systemic change, for change within our police systems for years and no one's heard. And so here we are at this moment. And uh, we want to use this space uh, to have real conversations. And real conversations involve real listening. They involve real learning. They involve growth. And they often involve somebody feeling uncomfortable. At least that's what I've discovered in the many decades that I've been alive. And um, the other night I was talking, my kids asked me, have you ever felt like this? Have you ever seen this? And um, um, I said, yeah, I have. I remember being a little girl um, living in Washington, D.C. when Martin Luther King was shot. And I remember the unrest at the nation's capital. I lived like 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. And I remember the city was on fire and um, it was scary. And I remember my Uncle Bobby uh, going right into the thick of it and talking about justice and talking about empathy and talking about listening and talking about understanding. And um, I remember Rodney King here in Los Angeles. And I think these kinds of moments are moments. They're moments to listen. They're moments to step up. They're moments to stand up. And if you don't know what to say, that's okay. Just say, I don't know what to say. It's kind of like, um, I found a lot of people say stuff like that after somebody's passed away. And people often uh, say, I just don't know what to say to the person who's just lost somebody. And I often say, just say that. I don't know what to say, but I wanted you to know that I'm here and that my heart is with you. And that really goes a long way. So to those of you who find yourself today not really knowing what to say, not being able to really find the words, not sure whether you should say something at all, that's okay. Just say, I don't know what to say. Reach out to somebody um, who has a different skin color than you and say, I don't know what to say. Help me learn about this moment. So there's Patrick. And so Patrick, I was just explaining to everybody why we wanted to gather today and that the whole point of our uh, home together had always been about being home together and being together and that we were saying that we never thought it was more important uh, than this moment to talk about what it means to be together and what how we move forward together. So we've been, we wanted to have a conversation with a great friend of ours, Devon Franklin, 
um, who is always talking about how we can come together. His language is really um, about that. And I thought he would be a really good person today to answer some of your questions, to walk us through what's the best way to walk through this together and um, how we can move forward. So he is on here. Hi, Patrick. Somebody's saying hi. Um, people say, I'm so sad for the families who've lost, lost loved ones to senseless violence. Yeah, um, we are too. And uh, there's a lot of heartbreak, enough heartbreak to go around. And um, so this is what today is about. It's about listening. It's about learning. Oh, there's Devon. And it's, about, um, and it's designed to be helpful to people who don't know. No, it says Devon declined. Wow. <laughs> and I had Devon. Devon couldn't decline. So he might have went off for maybe something. He happened. what? I said maybe he went off for a sec. Something happened. Something happened. It says Patrick's so quiet. <laughs> well, I was letting you speak. <laughs> yeah, maybe people don't. Maybe that's he's come back. There he is. There it is. Waiting for Devon. I hope it doesn't say he declined. Now, can I go? <laughs> there he is. Hey, hey, on my end, it said it, the request expired, so there was no declining. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, sure. So, Devon, thank you so much for coming on. You know, we've been of doing course. these home togethers for the last couple of months while we've been living together, and we crossed out the home today because we really want it to be about being together. All right, we want to, um, as I said to you, figure out what together means at this moment in our nation's history. And I want to get some guidance from you about what's the right thing to say, what's the right thing to do. And let me begin by asking you how you're doing. You know what? I mean, um, I'm doing well, you know, um, considering all that's going on. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's critical is our own mental health through this and yeah. so, you know, yes, as a black man, feeling the pressures, feeling the, the rage and the anger, I still can say I'm doing well. You know, I'm alive. Uh, I'm able to, you know, channel my anger in a positive way, figure out how to do something instructive in this moment. Uh, am I enraged by what I see? Absolutely. Uh, yet I still say I'm doing well. You know, I, I can't allow the things that are happening to get me out of that place. Because if it does, then, then uh, you know, the cops win in that way. Those cops that have taken lives, our lives, then win, right? Because not only do they take the life of the person that's no longer here, but then they prevent us from doing what we were created to do. So uh, I'm sensitive to what's going on, but that's a long answer to your question. I am doing well. And I know that, uh, you know, hard times, but we're, we're going to make it through. Devon, so many people that I've spoken to at this moment say, like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Can I say something? Should I not say something? Do I do what? What do I do? What's your best advice to people in this moment? How do we use our voices in a constructive way, but also in a sensitive way? And how do we yeah, go you know, beyond beyond just using our voices or spreading social media or doing that? What What are you know actual steps for mm -hmm. for people to go out there and and ignite change? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so let's unpack it because I got a call from a, <laughs> a friend um, that, uh, you know, Patrick, you probably don't know, but Maria certainly knows her. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into who that was, but long story short, I got this call yesterday and it, and it was very much a similar conversation. And so I said, okay, we got to have an honest conversation, right? Mm. She was white, I'm black. I said, let's just have an honest conversation. So I want to do the same thing here. Great. So let's unpack the first part in terms of what to say. Tell me, what are you all's fears? You know, as a white woman, as a white man, what are your fears around this moment and what to say or not to say, or where are you maybe trepidatious? Well, I actually don't have that much fear about okay, saying good. something in this moment. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with that I've lived through moments. I was raised by two people who stepped into moments, raised in a family. Um, so, but everybody else is like, don't say you have empathy for people whose businesses are looted. Don't say you understand the protesters. Don't, we don't want to hear from a white woman, or we do want to hear from someone like you. You should be saying more. You should be saying less. So I think that there is some fear, and I do have some fear about, is this my place? 
and can I mm. use my voice? Uh, does my voice have any merit in this place? Um, mm. So I think there's some of that. Mm -hmm. and, and yet many other of my African-American friends have said, this is exactly the moment you should mm -hmm. be using your voice because this isn't just a moment for African-Americans. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's good. What about you, Patrick? Um, I would say my biggest, um, I, I, I too don't have a, a fear of um, speaking out and I'm not worried about, you know, some people like right away on my Instagram when I do post come and come at me saying, you know, don't support this. There's protests that are turning violence, everything like that. And they're, they're disregarding the whole message that I'm pushing. But I do, um, at the same time, I don't support violence. And I don't support the looting of these small businesses that just came out of two months of, uh, uh, you know, a terrible economic time and, and now are just open for business yesterday and now are, are reclosing today. Um, and, you know, I want to be mindful of, of them as well. And um, speaking, and, and this morning I went to clean up in Santa Monica, and um, I, I just wanted to be, is there both? You know, right away when I say I'm going to clean up in Santa Monica this morning, people are like, wow, you're, you're not for Black Lives Matter. And then I also post about Black Lives Matter, and then people are like, wow, you're not for All Lives Matter. And I'm like, what, what are you right. doing? I'm yeah. trying to do both here. I don't want these businesses to struggle. And I want my my peers and, and and individuals that are part of America to feel like they're equal and that they're mm. like and I have yeah. a platform that I feel like I need to utilize to support um, other people and to uh, you know bring justice and, and equality. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean this 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 is why we all are as close as we are because we just get down and just have real connection and conversation. This is how we flow. So I want to unpack a, a number of things and thank you for, for saying that so I can really take it in because I think what happens is that, you know, the, the root issue why we're here is police brutality, hmm. specifically against, uh, you know, people of color. Um, right. And that police brutality has persisted for generations. So, right. so just a week ago, you know, police, that act of police brutality that we all, you know, unfortunately had a chance to witness was the spark that lit the keg, right? So that's the real issue that sometimes we lose focus on because what happens is we're focused on the protests and then everyone wants to talk about the violent nature to the protests. So as a result, oh yes, the violent nature is, 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 in, is, is something that needs to be dealt with, but let's deal with the root cause. Yeah. The root cause is police continuously from, I mean, for generations, almost since the inception of the police in this country has been an operation that has uh, been prejudiced and has oppressed people of color, specifically black men. And that's not a hyperbole, that is literally historical fact when we go back and look at it, right? Yeah. So I think we have to always, when we talk about what's right to say and what's right to do, I think it's always important to stay clear of what the real issue is and how we can stay united in order to really make, in, make a hit on that issue. So to that standpoint of like, okay, well, what's right to say? What's not right to say? I think we all have to go into our heart and really identify what is my role in this moment and where do I feel comfortable and where do I feel led and called to have an impact? This issue, I mean, there's a million different things that we all can do. Um, but I believe that each one of us should be more targeted in our efforts, in our anger, in our activism, and really focus on the thing that we feel most compelled to do in this moment and really do that. I do think, you know, as Maria, as you mentioned earlier, yes, as black, as a black man, we need the solidarity of white men and white women right now. As, as black women who also get, uh, you know, brutalized by the police, we need the solidarity. So what does that solidarity look like? Yes, yeah. for sure. It is, it is how you, it is the, yes, it's like saying I'm with you. Yes, for sure, yeah. right? A post right. about Black Lives Matter, a post about, you know, I'm with you. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. We need that. Um, what we also need, though, is in the conversations that we are not in, when you are around your dinner table, when you are having the conversations with your friends, it's really, that's where ma major change can happen. Mm -hmm. Because that's where 
you know, again, like if you're sitting around the, the, the dinner table and you're having conversations with your white friends who, have, who will never have the experience that I've had, right? Never had to endure what I've had to endure. It's very easy for the same prejudice that lays the foundation for what we're fighting against to persist mm -hmm. because the hearts and the minds don't change. Right. And the reason why I think that this George Floyd um, incident has cut through um, one, it was, it was horrific, and we all, unfortunately, were privy to witness it. However, when you look at the pandemic, you know, we've been working from home, right? The news cycle's been nothing but the pandemic. But what has happened is we've all been more focused and connected than ever before. Right. I don't believe that, that we could be able to make the change that's possible in this moment if the pandemic had not been the backdrop of all of us sharing a common experience. All of our lives were impacted by the pandemic because we all have to social distance, we have to wear masks. It's a common language. So as part of that common language and that community that this pandemic has built, even though there's still division around it, we all can talk the same thing about the pandemic. Whether we agree with masks or not, we all have something that now unites us because we all understand what the virus is. Now, when you look at the, this issue with police brutality that has just happened, now we all are paying attention like never before, but it cannot change unless the hearts and minds of white men and white women change. Yes, we need your voice. We need you to post all of that, but it's really about saying, okay, how do I not allow my privilege to create a blind spot right. that then I find comfort in? Yeah. How Go ahead. So please jump in. I don't mean this is a monologue. No, but, I mean, that was a dialogue. So please no, jump but in. I, I love that because that's so that's a an action that every single person can take to make sure their dinner table doesn't look exactly like them. Right. That. And so you said that if your dinner table is all white, you won't have any idea of what someone like you has endured. And I just want to ask you when you said that, Devon. Can you tell me what you have endured? what it's been like for you? Sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like, I mean, we're talking, I mean, you know, not even that long ago, you know, driving in Beverly Hills and being pulled over and saying, oh, what happened? Oh, the car fits the description of a car that got stolen right now. You know, I'm like, really? Okay. You know, here's my, you know, registration, insurance, all that, you know, and he checking the car. You know, of course, there was, there was nothing that happened. In before, whenever I've gotten pulled over, you is it, I've gotten to the place where you just can't have a conversation with a cop. You just it's like you know what, D yes sir, no sir. What would you like? Yes ma'am, no ma'am. Get out of the situation as as quickly as possible. The other part of it, which is really important, is that you know, and and I know this, uh, you know, hits home for you know both of you working in Hollywood in the media. You know, like let's talk about Hollywood, right? So. You know, I've been in Hollywood since I was 18 years old. I'm 42 now, you know, and, and this is we, Hollywood shapes the hearts and minds, the media and Hollywood, right? Entertainment and media shape the hearts and minds of perceptions about people of color and so many things all around the world. So here I am. I've been in Hollywood 24 years. You know, when I was an executive, there were times when I was referred to as a rapper in meetings, okay? You know, like, oh, here's our resident rapper. Let's hear what he has to say. Now, I don't rap. I don't, I don't rap, but just because I was the only black person in the room, you know, I've been mistaken for the bathroom attendant when I was an executive at a company. Yes, a bathroom attendant. Yes, absolutely. You know, I've been told that, you know, oh, well, we don't think that black people are going to want that when I've been, when I tried to get certain movies made. So wait a minute. So as a white person, you're going to tell me what works better for, for my experience. Right. But then this is perpetuated, right? It's perpetuated. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm grateful for the experience that I had while working at, at, um, as an executive. But when you look at the level of success that I had and the amount of money that I generated for the company, and you look at the level that I was at and you look at my pay, it didn't even compare to my, to my white counterparts who were handed movies over and over again, who never had to generate their own material, but still got sometimes double and triple the pay. So when you talk about what I've had to endure, you know, I've had to endure like, yes, understand that I am black. 
I, I am black. I love, I love being black. I'm not trying to change being black, but I also recognize that I've had to have a healthy understanding of that in order to navigate this business, this business being Hollywood and life. Because for some, they don't have, you know, faith and they don't have another way to process it because mentally and emotionally, it can be incredibly traumatic because you're not, when I'm working, I'm, I don't only have to think as a man or as, as a person in Hollywood, I got to think of as someone who's also black, right? right? That's, a, that's a different, it's like, oh, how am I going to be perceived, right? How am I going to be perceived? How is this going to come across? And so it's a duality. W.E.B. Du Bois talked about this, you know, this duality that we as, yeah, as right. black people have, you know, as not only having to do the job, but then also what does that mean? So these are some of the things that I've had to endure over the years, but I've looked at it like, okay, if this is my cross to bear, how then do I do it in a way that it can be positive, in a way that can produce change? Because me being black is not going to change. So I can complain about that all I want. I can complain about the injustice, but what am I doing about it? And right. so that is why I've tried to use a lot of the experiences that I've had and the pain that I feel from those experiences yeah. to say, I've got to do something positive and figure out a way to not let it become such a burden that I get so depressed that I can never fully become who God created me to be. Right. Speaking of faith, I kind of want, I mean, you're, you're so articulate with, with faith and um you know i mean you have so many different kind of uh, professions per se i mean i know you from <laughs> yes. motivational speaking to the business in, in film to producing to uh your faith work as well the author. to author yeah I mean, it's, yes it's countless, it's countless. but i i want to you just had mentioned faith and i kind of want to tap on that of um you know what what are you what are you telling people right now um that are followers of faith and that aren't using their kind of voice to yeah. utilize compassion, to reach out to the other side and, and say, I understand what you're, you know, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm sure, I'm, you know. Yeah, you know, what I say is, I, I say a couple things. I mean, I, I say, you know, there's a scripture um, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, you know, he was speaking to the Israelites who at the time were under Roman oppression. Uh, you know, they were under heavy taxation, uh, their freedoms were restricted. And he said to them in the Sermon on the Mount, you are salt and you are light. The first thing he said is you are, you are salt. He said, what happens to, if salt loses its saltiness? Now, a grain of salt cannot actually uh, scientifically lose its saltiness. How does something become less salty? Because it is mixed in with other elements that drown out its distinctiveness. So to people of faith, I say, uh, are you allowing politics of the moment to allow you to lose the power of your voice. Mm -hmm. In a moment like this, when you look at the life of Christ, when we talk about a faith perspective, we're following Christ, then what did Christ do? He was there for those that could not do for themselves. And, and he's speaking, and even that moment, he's speaking to the Israelites. I mean, they did not feel like the salt of the world. They didn't feel like they were the light of the world. And here he is affirming who they were. And not only did he affirm it, but he ultimately sacrificed his entire life, not only for them, but for all of us. So when I'm talking to, you know, other people of faith that may be apathetic, I try to say, no, 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 you cannot say you follow Christ and be silent during a time like this. Now, here's the other thing that's really important, though. We, what, what we cannot do and what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to be the, um, uh, the police on how someone is supposed to speak up. I'm not right. going to do that because then I perpetuate the same seed of evil and brutality that I'm trying to heal. So there are some people that I know that I love that I don't think that they've spoken up enough, but what I'm not gonna do is judge them. I will, I will say about the action, hmm, I think we can do better here, but I'm not gonna judge them because right now where there's so much hate and division, even if I feel like someone of faith could use their voice more, I'm not gonna use that as an excuse to demonize them or to attack them. I'm not gonna do that. Right. Devon, what did you think about uh, the president's speech, uh, which was just moments ago, and then uh, after his speech in the Rose Garden, he walked across to the church and held up a Bible? I saw that. I saw that. I, I just think that we have to, whether you're Democrat or Republican, this is a moment to let's go, let's look above politics for a moment so that we are not wrapped into the propaganda to mean 
that moment was propaganda. It's like, I'm going to, one, I'm not going to verbally get up in front of the audience, get in front of the, the country in the world and say, my prayers are with the family of George Floyd. Mm. I'm not like, not to get up and say, you know what, we are, we are, we, I have the, you know, Justice Department into it. I want this to be brought quickly to try, like to not to right, get up and right. address the problem. Police yeah. brutality is a problem. We need, no, but he's going to get up and say, oh, it's all about, you know, military, you know, activating the military and activating a clause that has not been used, you know, in, in, you know, in our generation yeah. in order to stop the protesters. I mean, and then to go with the Bible, I'm like, no, if you are following that book, you could not behave right. the way you're behaving. If you are following that book, and if that book means anything to you, that book is a manual for how to navigate humanity. Yeah, that Jesus book is Christ a was, you know, it had righteous anger, right? Jesus Christ had righteous anger. He turned up the tables in the temple. And so I think that, you know, there is a difference, obviously, that people have pointed out between righteous anger, between peaceful protests and looting, right? And so I think that, you know, this is a moment, correct me if I'm wrong, where people need calm leadership, steady leadership, and leadership that points us forward together, right? Do you believe yes. that we can navigate this moment, and it is a moment, right? Uh, a critical, crucial moment, that we can navigate it forward. This generation has to do better than my generation, and even your generation, right? We're all like 20 years apart here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I, I, feel in some, I feel in some ways back to where I grew up, right? My uncles fought and my father uh, started the war on poverty, started Head Start, started legal services for the more, started community action, was the head of the uh, um, you know, community action in Chicago. It's kind of, in many ways, it feels like we're right back where we started. And I wanna believe that we've made progress so that this generation can look at a generation moving forward together. And I also, you, caught, you said something in the beginning, you said, those cops. We don't generalize, right? It's not every cop, right? That's right. It's That's not, true. so it's like, but we're talking about systematic change, change within the police system. That's what people are advocating for. Mm -hmm. Social, you know, prison reform. These are reforms that would point to heard, seen, mm -hmm. got it, and we can navigate a better future, correct? We can navigate a better future, um, you know, but here, here's what I think is so important is, is that we can't allow, yes, do, do the protest, do the, do the, uh, does the violence and the, the, the rioting need to stop? Yes, of course it does. I mean, no, if you, you know, with uh, George Floyd's brothers today, you know, yeah, one yeah. hand it was, you know, peace, other hand is justice, right? So, you know, no one, no one that's a real significant part of this movement is advocating for those things. But it's so important to not let the violence and the rioting become a smokescreen to feel comfortable not to go into action. Great, right. It's really important because then what happens, this is what happens. And, and I can talk to y'all like family because this is what happens. White people see the news and then they say, oh, that those protests are nothing but violence. And then they allow that excuse to yeah. get them to feel comfortable to not get into action. Right. To your point about this generation, my generation, past generation, the goal has to be, how do we stop police brutality? Yes, there are other, there are, there are a myriad of issues, but when we really boil down the okay. one significant we, change that we can make, it's about police brutality. And a lot of that, you know, I looked through Obama's, um, I read his, his article and I looked through what he, his suggestions are. I mean, you know, he yeah. got 153 pages of worth of suggestions if you, if you check it out. <laughs> I've posted them today. There are a lot. I didn't read There's them. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it fundamentally, to me, comes down to, uh, you know, really participating in our local level, participating right now with what's going on locally, because that ultimately is, is where a lot of the change can happen. So yes, of course, you know, the election in November is important, but so often we put so much election, so much attention on these elections, the national elections that we actually miss the change in our local elections to produce that change. But it really, it really comes from us 
coming together. You know, I mean, seriously, like this is a time for, I'm telling you, it's like as black people, we've been, we've been beating the drum. We've been talking about it. We've been enduring it, you know? So now it's like, yo, how do we all, you know, come together and really make a change? And I just want to go back to something we were talking about earlier, which is even if, even if there is no diversity, right? Or representation at your dinner table. And I don't mean yours specifically. I just mean in yeah. general. Yeah. Bringing the diversity of thought to the conversation mm -hmm. to help change the hearts and minds of those that you are with that we may never get a chance to talk to, right? I may never get a chance to, in, to, to, to hang out with some of the people you all deal with day by day. But if you bring that diversity of thought, you may change and challenge their way of thinking. Right. Right. which then could potentially have a systemic positive change. Because what happens is that if the conversation just say in stylos, or sometimes, you know, you may be around certain people and they're saying something, and it's not you all, I'm just saying, I'm talking about in general, like white families that are having in white social circles, that the conversation about Black Lives Matter and, and really about police brutality have, to got, have got to filter into white, powerful social circles. And it's got to go beyond lip service Absolutely, money is important. You know, we've got to donate to these organizations which are on the front lines fighting, for sure. We've got to affect policy, for sure. Because policy creates the law by which so much is, you know, is followed by, by the law. So it is important, though, in, in these white social circles, for influential circles, for this message to finally take root. So again, whether I'm there personally or not, or someone like me, that diversity of thought is represented and can still be discussed as a possible way to change those types of hearts and minds. I love that. That's such a easy thing when people are asking, what can I do? Just diversity of thought, bringing those conversations to your table and vice versa, right? That's how we begin to mentally get together, get together in our hearts. And obviously, you know, the more diverse your table is, I always talk a lot about the table, and Devon has been to our table, but the, the makeup of that table, you learn different thoughts. That's why I always have different people of different yeah. political opinions at the table, because that's the way to grow and hear what else is actually out there. So Devon, as we kind of move into this week, it's, I don't think that, you know, some people looked and they thought the president might grab this moment to calm everything down to- Oh no. That didn't happen, huh? No. No. <laughs> no, yeah. no. I think we got to stop looking to the president for anything positive, unfortunately. I think we just got to, you know, understand that because uh, if we if we don't have that expectation, it won't we won't be told that down. So if there are moments when he rises to the occasion, great. But I, I, I personally, I stopped looking to the White House for taking my cues on, on what to do in this moment. And so I think it's really important that those of us who are together, that you know, give us suggestions on who we can talk to, who we can continue this conversation with, how we can open up this conversation in ways uh, to impact thought, to impact hearts. I always say in my Sunday paper, and you've written for it several times, it's about inspiring hearts and minds. That's what creates change, one person yes. at a time. And just as Mark Cuban said last time to us on our conversation, you don't have to be the leader right. to lead. I love that. You know. You don't have to be the leader <laughs> to lead. Leader right. To lead. And, and if others you, can lead by example. We don't have to look, like you said, yeah. to the White House or to the president to, for us to continue to lead by mm -hmm. example. Someone else is. Mm -hmm. what, what we all have to, we all have to be leaders of our, of our life, right? Our own, we right. have to be a leader of, of, of one. And, and when we are a leader of one, then we can decide which direction that we go. And I think that's really important because sometimes we outsource our own personal leadership to you know, the White House or to others waiting for them versus no, I'm gonna lead myself, my, me, one, in the direction that I feel that we need to go. I mean, that's why Patrick, I, like, I love the fact that you said you went to clean up because it's, we live in a world where this is a dynamic issue, right? So you going to clean up is not, you're not against the protesters. You're, you're, you're saying I am a citizen yeah. Right. And I feel compelled to do something. Right. And, if, and if what I got to do is go out and clean up some debris, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I'm a leader of one. And this is what I feel compelled to do. And by cleaning up, 
That's not a stance against Black Lives Matter. That's not a stance against the protest. If anything, it's like, hey, here's where we are in life. We got a mess, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to be a part of cleaning up the mess. I'm not going to be a part of contributing to it. So what you did is you're modeling behavior that whether any of us get out there and get a broom, we still have to be a part of cleaning up the mess. And you're right. People are going to, they're going to talk about you. They're going to come against you, but don't let that shape your resolve. Right. Because too often we're so worried about these social media gangsters and all that. Mm -mm, I don't care. Yeah. Write what you want to write. Change. When, and that's when you know you're heading in the right direction because people are opposing it. People are talking bad about you. Whenever you're going in the wrong direction, most people don't say much. But when you're headed in the right direction, you get all that conflict. So I respect the fact that you did that. And I would just affirm actions like that. And don't let anybody shake you out of things like that. You can still have a heart for small business. And I want you to still have a heart for the movement, too. You know, it's like, yes, I'm for the movement. I'm for, for uh, you know, ending police, police brutality. And I'm also for figuring out how we don't let our small businesses go under. It's not, it's not like if I'm for one, I'm against the other. Right, right. You know, right. We, we do live a, a, it is a complex world. And, and this is why I go back to one other thing I said, and I don't mean to keep talking, y'all. This is your no, program. Great. <laughs> we, we, know, we, we said we want to listen. We want to listen. So that's great. You know, I just want to go back to one thing, which is, which is we have to resist the temptation to, to take on the hate that we're trying to, to heal. Yes, 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 yes. It's Absolutely. really important. And I know this is a nuance, right? It's like, uh, do I like the president and what he's doing? I don't. I can come against what he's doing, but I, as a Christian, I personally try not to attack the person. Right. I try to come against the issue because we there's too much division right now and everybody's attacking one another and not you can't say this and you can't do that and and we're just you know shooting each other down verbally and and from our computers and our phones and and i just say you know what all i can do is leave myself right. i will come against the action but i will resist the temptation to perpetuate the very hate that i'm trying to do my best to heal great wow that's beautiful devon well thank you so much for joining us of course. On this really, really important day. I think these conversations are critical. And when I asked you to do this, I said, you think this will be helpful? This is good to do, right? And oh, like, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. These no, I think so. A lot of people said it was helpful and they enjoyed yeah. hearing it from both sides and, and having an honest, open, vulnerable conversation. And I like the way that you started out because that's, uh, you know, that was a, a good way to hear what we were worried about saying right. or not worried about or what. You know, so I think that um, that was great to hear, and we appreciate you coming on and talking to us. And um, yeah, and any and Devon, if you have suggestions where we can keep this conversation oh, going, yes. you know, because these platforms are important. We all, as you said, leader of one. Platforms are important, and we've yes. wanted to use this platform always to, as we said during the pandemic, to highlight the helpers, the healers, and the cultivators of hope. We've got to cultivate hope right now. We've got to yes. cultivate hope. I want a world in which my children and grandchildren and your children and your grandchildren and all those women who raised you. Oh my God, <laughs> all those women who raised you. Uh, Devon has so many women who raised Yes, them. I got a whole, the whole coalition. <laughs> the whole coalition. And I think, you know, mothers, I think I've over the weekend tried to kind of call upon mothers and women to step up in this moment as well. And uh, we can all do something now. And I think you were so great to lead one and uh, to be, and to hold the paradox, what you think is the paradox that's not, right? Right, right, exactly. right, right. Well, God right. bless you, exactly. Devon. Thank you so much. Follow Devon if you don't already. He has such an inspiring account. Uh, he puts prayers up there all the time and quotes, and he definitely leads us forward on a daily basis. So I, I turn to him uh, every day to hear his prayers. <laughs> so I hope you do. You. If you don't follow him already, please do. And awesome. Thank you, Devon. God bless Appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. God bless you, too. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. So there, Devon Franklin. Um, so grateful that so many of you joined us back here on Together. Uh, we took the home out, even though we're kind of still home together, but we thought we that it was together. that we are still home together. Yeah. But uh, that this is a moment really about being together and all that that means uh, to all of us.
and to all of you. And so if you have suggestions uh, regarding people you think we should talk to at this moment and how we can make this moment be more than a moment and how we can um, really lead with our hearts and um, listen and learn and grow and evolve and be better. And uh, that's our commitment. Um, and uh, I hope it's also yours. So we want to thank you so much for joining us on this first day of June. It's the first of June. I think so. Yeah. No, I think it's the first day of June. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's June the first day. That's Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. Where did March uh, and April and May? They went. We were home together. So uh, thank you. Very many of you are saying thank you. So Bishop, Bishop Noel Jones. Okay, write that down. I want. I love that. Bishop Any other suggestions? You can DM us uh, if you have suggestions. And uh, is it say Michael Beckwith? Uh, yeah, I like Michael Beckwith. Yes, uh, he'd be terrific. You're right. Um, Great. So we will, I'm writing them down. So yes, DM us, whatever yes, it is. Yes, DM us. Yes. And so um, thank you for thanking us. And thank you for being here uh, with us today. God bless you. And remember, uh, lead with your heart. Be a leader of one. You don't have to be the leader. Uh, T.D. Jakes. Yeah. Yes. Bishop T.D. Jakes, what is, is it? You don't have to be the leader, what? what you, don't have the to be the le you don't have to be the leader oh, to lead. You don't have to be the leader to lead. Okay, God bless you and thank you so much for joining us. Bye.